All right, class, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Peter. We'll be in chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Good morning. morning. No, you're fine. Um, And then we'll eventually have PowerPoint. For some reason, uh, there seem to be some issues uh, with it uploading. Um, but it's all right, because as long as we've got the Word of God, you will be able to follow along. So we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 2 momentarily. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share a few things with you all. Uh, first of all, uh, it was really neat. One of our, one of our um, family members, they, they texted a bunch of us this morning and uh, we're expressing how much they're going to miss us. They're going to be traveling. And I just thought that was really neat. Uh, if you're visiting or if you're here and you haven't uh, yet joined yourself to, to this local work, uh, I just want to remind you that we are interested in wanting to, to be your family. Uh, it's really neat because this individual I know personally uh, struggles with their physical family, and maybe you relate to that. I, I certainly understand having divisions in physical family, and uh, that's the neat thing, is that we are united by, by the blood of Christ coming together uh, in unity as members of one another, and uh, that was just really encouraging. Uh, and also wanted to share how much this class has uh, benefited me, how much studying uh, First Peter with y'all has been uplifting to me. Last week, I mentioned that I've been going through First Peter uh, with Karen, and she, uh, in fact, was baptized yesterday. So for anyone that didn't get uh, that update or that information, we have a new sister in Christ. Her name is Karen Hart. I sent out the information on an email. If for whatever reason you want to text her, call her, email her, send her a, a, a note of encouragement, and you don't, don't have her information, please uh, let see me so I can get that information to you. And also, she uh, desires that we continue to pray for her and her family. Uh, she understands the struggles of her physical family and uh, some divisions that Christ will bring within her family. So she just asked for prayers um, for herself and for her family. She is not here with us this morning, uh, but hopes to be with us at uh, a future time. So let's keep Karen in our prayers. First Peter chapter 2. We've been studying about the true grace of God. As you try to work on teaching this book, I want you guys to also figure out how you would present this book to someone else. So typically when I meet someone and they're interested in, in <clears throat> having an open Bible discussion, that's some of the language that I use, uh, I like to start with questions like, well, like, do you love God? Where, where do you worship? Uh, tell me about your relationship with God. And uh, as, as they start revealing some things about where they're at in their own spiritual life, uh, and they inevitably say some thing that uh, catches my attention, then I, I can know right away if I need to start with just, do I need to prove that God is real? Do I need to prove that uh, Jesus Christ is real? But more often than not, the people that I meet down here already have an idea of who God is. They already have an idea of who Jesus is. And so not to say that the Gospels aren't a great starting point. If you know how to uh, read and teach the Gospels, then you know, by all means do that. First Peter has been really effective in wanting to and trying to study with those people. And the way that I typically present it is, uh, do you want to do a study on grace? And again, people say yes, uh, because that's one of the uh, prettier words in the Bible. And Peter says in First Peter chapter five, verse 12, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And yet, as we've studied, there's a lot of difficulties that come with saying this is the true grace of God because we get into things like obedience. We get into things like holiness. We get into things like being adopted and having a father. We get into things like submission that don't sound like graces at all. And so it's a, an amazing book to study with people. <clears throat> and again, I just commend you on working on how to uh, get into a study uh, with people into First Peter. The other nice thing about First Peter is a lot of people don't really know First Peter. So if you're like, have you ever studied First Peter? People are like, 
you know, I've asked some of y'all this. You know, have you studied First Peter? You're like, I'm sure I've seen it. Um, so it's just a really easy book to get into. Why don't we study it? Why don't we read it uh, together? Why don't we have a, a Bible discussion uh, through First Peter and we can kind of uh, work through some things. I've tried to eliminate the phrase Bible study from uh, my own vocabulary because that doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people uh, nowadays. Uh, maybe you and I understand the language, but can we just uh, read through First Peter? Can we have a, a discussion about First Peter as how I've benefited from uh, trying to get into studies with people. So as we get into 1 Peter chapter 2, this section uh, starts in verse 13. And just notice the, the bold and underlined words. The first thing that he says, depending on your translation, is submit. So Peter says, I've been writing to you about the true grace of God, and now we get to the point where he says, submit. And then verse 16, submit. Verse 18, submit. He's going to use it three more times. First Peter uses the word submission or submit six times in his, in his book, more times than any other New Testament author. And that, I think, is intentional, right? So what does he say about submission? He says, submit to every human authority because of the Lord whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or the governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Household slaves, submit to your masters with all reverence, not only to those, not only to uh, the good and gentle but, uh, ones, but also to the cruel. And then again, the other times you find um, the word submit, especially in the Christian Standard Version, which is the standard I'm trying, uh, the version I'm trying to read from uh, in class, different from what I'm used to in the New American Standard, uh, you're going to find that same word in 3 1 and 5 5. With that uh, being said, let's go ahead and go to God in a word of prayer and ask him to be with us as we study this morning. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our holy God, we are excited uh, this morning to come into your presence. It is exciting to know that uh, our country is about to reflect and celebrate a time of freedom. And it is more exciting to know that you have already liberated us. As we looked at last week, we were people who were caught up in darkness, and yet we were freed from that darkness. We were freed, and uh, you have asked us to use our freedom to proclaim the excellencies of you who called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We're so excited, Father, that this morning we're going to celebrate our freedom with uh, a feast with our Savior, a feast with our brother Christ Jesus. And we are so excited this morning that we are going to be able to challenge ourselves and challenge one another to understand something that, that is difficult to understand, to understand how submission is, is a grace, to understand how submission helps us <clears throat> get to know your love and uh, grow in our appreciation for you. We know at times, Father, that it is difficult uh, to humble ourselves. But as uh, Peter will uh, tell us later on in his book, we, we need to learn how to do this, as difficult as it might be, because we recognize that you are opposed to the proud, but give grace to the humble. And we're so grateful that this morning we are gathered together to celebrate your mercy and your grace, your kindness, your everlasting love, your compassion that abounds, and we pray, Father, that you will be true to your word as you have always been and grant to us wisdom, wisdom in abundance, because we understand that you, uh, in Christ Jesus, have already lavished all wisdom and insight uh, to us. And so we pray that uh, that will be seen in this class, and we pray that you will be um, with each one of us as we study these things together. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, the constant encouragement that we receive in coming together as your body. And we thank you for the excitement that we share in getting to uh, prepare our minds for worship uh, coming up here shortly. Thank you for all these things, and it's in Christ's name that we offer this prayer. Amen. All right, <clears throat> so I want to show you something, uh, and I hope this works. 
The first question I asked, and I should have gotten a piece of paper, but the first question I asked you was to define submission. In your own words, define submission. Uh, and I want to show you how I go about, don't pay attention to the background, okay? <laughs> like, yeah, we're very cute, I know. Uh, I want you to understand how I go about uh, defining words. I am not a Greek scholar. I am not someone who uh, just has piles and piles of literature in, in my office. Uh, I have some books. Truthfully, I haven't opened a lot of books. Uh, I could probably uh, say confidently in uh, the past two years, I might have opened six books. Um, but this is typically how I go about uh, getting into a study. So I recorded my phone screen so you could see this is how I start when I get into uh, a text. So I type in Koine Greek, and it should say 1 Peter chapter 2. I go down to Bible Hub, and I scroll down to the verse or the word that I'm looking for. And here I'm looking for the word submit in verse 13. So I click on the Greek word submit, and then I have this come up. And this tells me every part of speech, every use, every definition, where it's found. And this is my favorite part. If you scroll down to the bottom, it tells you the first place that this word is found. And it tells you all the other, in this case, 38 references that it's found in the New Testament. So all I do on my phone, you, you guys are seeing it right here. Uh, I go to Google, I type in Koine Greek, uh, whatever passage I'm studying. In this case, it was 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, I look up the word or the verse that I'm trying to, to dissect, and I just click, and I keep clicking. It is amazing how easy it is to come to a knowledge and an understanding of God's word. I told my wife earlier this year, if I had been a preacher in the 70s, like I couldn't have done this. Like I would not have been effective in the 70s. Um, I'm not smart enough to, to do what our brethren did in establishing foundational truths and getting uh, uh, all these commentaries and getting lexicons. And it's just, it's amazing how simple it is nowadays to become proficient in the Word of God. So uh, this is literally what I do. So when I ask you the first question, using either a dictionary uh, or your own words to define submission, that's how I found my definition. I typed in Koine Greek, 1 Peter chapter 2. I looked up the word uh, on Bible Hub. And I know that video was fast, but I, I can show you how to do this. Super simple. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm being very transparent. Like, this is what you guys support me to do, to use the internet, okay? Um, and that's where I found out this definition. So, the Greek word is listed above. Again, I'm not much for trying to pronounce or, or really uh, learn the Greek, but I know that it's important. And literally it means, or translated, to place uh, or rank under, to subject, to obey, to yield to one's control. It is often used in this militant uh, type of uh, language. So someone comes under submission of someone else's authority. This is a willing choice. I know that there are people that are higher than me, uh, or I know there are people that I can place an authority over me, so I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to choose to come under them. And I say that because I think for many years I fooled myself into thinking that I was a humble and submissive person. Uh, a couple years ago when I, when I got here, uh, trying to do uh, some evangelistic things, uh, trying to get out to the apartment, sorry, I try to think about where my, uh, where we're at. Okay. So trying to get to those apartment complexes, literally right behind us, you can walk through the fence and get to those apartment complexes and the ones right over here. Uh, I wanted to, to kind of let people know we were here, right? So like, uh, here we are. Uh, if you need a family, if you need a place to worship, come here. And, uh, what better time to do that than, uh, December 25th or, or Easter, right? So, uh, I'm trying to print out some things and I print out, um, one, uh, uh, one of the copies that says, you know, uh, join us for, for an Easter worship. And that's literally what I said, Easter worship, because that language is used by everybody, right? Um, so 
one of the elders uh, saw that and was like, we, we can't do this. Like, we, we, can't, we can't put out Easter um, because of the connotations that maybe uh, other people have or, or brethren might become upset with this. Like, we can't do that. And so I said, well, I don't, you know, basically, like, I don't, I don't agree with you, but okay. Now, would submission look like this? All right, like, I don't agree with you, so I'm going to print out new flyers, which I did, and they just said, join us for worship on whatever, April 14th or whatever the date was. Uh, and I had 500 stacks of join us for Easter worship. Um, would it have been submission? And I want a real answer. I want an answer. Would it have been submission if I had said, you know what, like, we spent the money, we, we already have them, I don't see what the big deal is. It's not like people are going to bring these to worship service anyway. So what's the harm in me just handing them out anyway? Is that submission? Okay. I, I shared this example with, uh, with uh, one of the elders, and, and he was like, if you had done that, uh, you would not be here today. <laughs> uh, it is not submission. Why is it not submission, though? And this is where I guess we need some hands so we don't just uh, jump over each other. Why is that not submission? Yes, sir. I'm not surrendering my will for another's. I told you I, for many years, fooled myself into thinking I was a humble and submissive person. But this is what submission looked like in my mind. If the elders made a decision that I agreed with, I was like, yeah, like, that's a great idea. Like, I'll follow it. Like, I see the logic. I understand why we're doing it that way. I'm happy to support that. When they made a decision that I didn't agree with, I would complain, I would grumble, I would murmur, I would say why that was a dumb decision, and then maybe, maybe, I would still do things my own way. I think sometimes in marriages, we think that we're humble and we're submissive to our spouse, but if we just submit when it's agreeable, that's not submission. I think sometimes with my, my mom and my dad in trying to honor them, um, I would not submit to them if I didn't agree with their logic or I didn't agree with their decision. When the Bible instructs us to submit to one another, why would I submit to JD? Like, he's not more important than I am. The guy wears a pink shirt. Like, <laughs> Do we really submit to one another? And more importantly, do we see that as a grace of God? And we are defining grace as unmerited favor, a free gift from God. And this is, honestly, brethren, one of those times where if this is the gift I'm getting from God, like, I better have that gift receipt. <laughs> I don't want it. I'm going to take it back, and I'm going to exchange it for something that I do want. This is not an easy, easy concept. Uh, I showed you on Bible Hub how it tells me the first place this specific word is used for submission. And it was really interesting that the first time this is used is of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Jesus is the creator, according to, to John's uh, prologue. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, uh, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, all speaking of Jesus Christ. The Creator is born. The Creator, uh, at 12 years old, goes to Jerusalem with his parents. Uh, and at 12 years old, you have lost the Son of God. You talk about a heart attack, right? Like, you have lost the Son of God. <laughs> Uh, they go back, they find him in the temple, they, they bring him, and this is what the text says about this. And he, speaking of Jesus, the creator, mind you, the creator, went down with them, Joseph and Mary, his parents, and came to Nazareth, and he continued to be subject or submissive to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. How does Jesus show submission here? And I'm asking. I want an answer. How does Jesus show submission here? But how does that show his submission? Wasn't he supposed to be subject anyway? Like, he's a kid. He's 12 years old. 
12-year-olds got to do what their parents say, right? Not always. Yeah. How does he show submission? He is the son of God. He's, he could have looked at Joseph and Mary and been like, hey, I created you. I knew you before the foundation of the world. Before God opens his mouth and the universe comes out. I knew that you were going to be born. I don't have to do anything you say. But Jesus willingly subjected or submitted himself to the creation. Why do I believe that I'm excluded from submission from anyone? 1 Peter chapter 2, 13. Submit to every human authority. Now, when I read that, I find that difficult. You mean every human authority? See, like, I'm... I guess I claim I'm from L.A. now, but, you know, I guess technically I'm from Georgia, but whatever. Uh, don't you know there's a bunch of crooked cops out in L.A.? You want me to submit to those people? And in fact, it wasn't too long ago that in this country we had that question come up, right? How do I submit to people that are not honorable, how do I submit to a government that doesn't really care about me? How do I submit to a president who I don't agree with? How do I submit to a Senate that doesn't have my best interests in mind? No, what God wants me to do is that when the government gets corrupt, when authority gets corrupt, He wants me to take up a sword and to stand and fight for God, right? That's what God wants me to do. No, that's not what He says. It's not what he says at all. He says, I want you to submit. I find that extremely difficult. So, <laughs> we're called to submit to who? The governing authorities. Why is this difficult? Because not everyone is honorable. And not everyone is righteous. And not everyone submits to God. So how do I submit to someone who doesn't submit to God? And this is where we get into some of these texts. That is way too small for me to read. Uh, so we're going to go to Romans 13. We're going to go to Romans 13. And I apologize, I'm going to have to read from the, uh, my Bible right in front of me, New American Standard. Uh, Romans 13. I don't always like to go to other books uh, when I'm studying a text. And depending on the person whom I'm, who I am studying with, uh, I may or may not do what I'm doing with y'all uh, in going to other passages. Um, but in this case, I know that y'all are familiar with the Word of God, that y'all know where Romans is. Um, so we're going to go to Romans, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So I'm called to submit to the authorities. Peter says it's because they're there by God's hand. Paul says they're there by God's hand. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. I'm going to share a little bit about myself. Uh, so, from... <laughs> Uh, I want to say it was 2000, uh, 2011 to 2012, I drove with a suspended license, okay? From 2011 to 2012, I drove with a suspended license. Uh, in 2012, I got married and I started working for uh, a congregation out in California and I had an outstanding uh, uh, ticket that I needed to go back and pay. Uh, so I went to court. Uh, it was, I want to say, January or February of 2013. So I had only been with Studebaker for a few months. Um, I went to Georgia, flew out to Georgia with, with my wife. Uh, we go to court. I'm just expecting to, to, to pay the ticket, uh, to pay the fine. I was doing 100 in a construction zone. Uh, so really serious violation. Um, why? Don't laugh at me, okay? This is, 
Uh, I was doing 100 in a construction zone. Um, so I go and I'm just expecting to pay the ticket. I had the bright idea that I'm going to defend myself. So I get up there and I was like, man, y'all have no confidence in me. Uh, I get up there and my opening statement was, I know I'm guilty, but. And as soon as I said that, the judge shook her head. I get done with my spiel and she goes, we can't do anything. You already admitted guilt. What, what am I supposed to do? So I went to jail. Uh, I went to jail. I was supposed to be in there for 20 days. I was in there for 10 days. I have a job that I'm supposed to go back to because I'm supposed to preach on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> so for 10 days, I'm in jail. My license was suspended for another year. Another year. And you know what I would have done? Normally, the same thing I'd been doing. Just driving with a suspended license. You know who taught me to submit to authority? It wasn't my preacher. It wasn't, it wasn't my wife. It was a guy with a badge. Because I remember... While I was in jail, I had a conversation with one of the officers about baptism. And at the end of the conversation, he looked at me and he was like, I don't disagree with what you're saying necessarily. It's really hard to hear it from an inmate. It took me a long time And you're like, what does that have to do with Romans? It took me a long time to not just be sweating when police officers were driving behind me. It took a long time. And now, now when a police officer comes behind me, I hope they pull me over. Like I'm just like, please pull me over. Because I know I have a clean record. I know that I'm most likely not speeding or doing anything that I shouldn't be doing. And I'm like, give me an opportunity to talk to someone. Like, I want another opportunity to talk to a police officer about their faith. Uh, But I understand this. Like, I know what it's like to fear authority when you are doing evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom taxes do, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. I bet if I asked you, who here likes to support gospel preachers, every hand would go up. And I bet if I asked why, you would be like, because they're servants of God. They are ministers of God. You know who else is a minister of God? A police officer that pulled me over and arrested me. You know who else is a minister of God? That president that maybe you don't like. You want to support ministers? Paul says, pay your taxes. Give them honor. The more we can train ourselves to see the grace that God is offering us, the more we will be able to do things like this. So in Titus chapter 1, so I get why Paul says that. He's, he's in Rome. Maybe Rome has some good political leaders. Maybe they don't. Uh, but maybe they're like us and we just don't really know. What about Crete? What about Crete? Paul leaves this guy named Titus in Crete. And he says, I want you to appoint elders in Crete. What kind of people li- live in Crete? Uh, one of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars. Evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Where am I going to find an elder in this place? 
Later on in chapter 3, he says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. What kind of leaders do they have in Crete? Liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. They don't have good leaders. And Paul says, you've got to teach them how to submit. You've got to teach them to subject themselves to Republicans, to Democrats, to whatever, fill in the blank. To slander no one. No, 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 wait, Paul. You mean I can't slander Republicans because they, they protect uh, Christian rights, correct? I'm allowed to, to slander the Democrats. Or, or, Paul, wait, you're saying I can't slander Democrats because they're looking out for the little guys. They're looking out for the sojourner, for the foreigner, for the orphan, for the widow. I'm allowed to slander Republicans who are just greedy. My point, I have no party loyalties, in case you haven't figured that out. Um, Slander no one. No one. Not to be contentious. To be gentle. Showing every consideration. And I want this to say for all people who fear God. And I want this to say, maybe if it doesn't say that, most people. But he says all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. So going back to 1 Peter, Peter says, I need you to submit to the government. I need you to submit to these ministers of God. I need you to silence the ignorance of foolish men. I need you to submit and to honor the emperor. Now, where, where you place this book, if you say that Nero is already the emperor, isn't that a hard guy to submit to? You want me to submit to the guy that's burning my family alive? Like, that's the guy you want me to submit to and honor? Peter says, yep. That's exactly who I need you to submit to. And if you say this is before persecution starts, does he not know what kind of people the Romans are? Peter says, it doesn't matter. you got to submit to them. That is God's grace. Now, the next thing he says, and I need to advance the class, I'm so sorry, is slaves. Now, I want you to put yourself in this situation. This is a, a, an exercise that I often do. I try to think of like how exciting it would be to get a letter from Peter. Like, and then you gather all your friends together, and you're like sitting around a fire, and you're like, hey, we're going to read this letter that Peter just sent us. And he's been saying all these things, and now he addresses you, the person who's always overlooked, slaves. It would be like if I was preaching and I said, hermanos. Now, in our Spanish brother, I'm like, oh, man, he's talking to us. Like, this is exciting. Slave, so you perk up. Submit. Luke Hurd can submit to his master because his master loves him. Man, Luke Hurd is well fed. Luke Hurd is taken care of. The master went and bought Luke Hurd's wife. And now Luke and Christina are serving that master together. I see why that guy submits. But guess what? I'm hungry today. And guess what? I have a black eye because my master is unjust. Wouldn't God's gift be you don't have to submit to that guy anymore. You are freed because all people have been made equal under Christ. He says, submit to your masters with all reverence, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the cruel. Why? Why do I have to submit to this guy? For this, or sorry, for it brings uh, favor, or this is a gracious thing, or this is a grace. If because of consciousness of God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. You know what God's grace is to that slave? You get to submit, and you get to suffer, because you know God. Now be honest, <laughs> does that sound like a gift? Not at all. For what credit is there if when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it? But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this is a gracious thing. Some of your translations say, this is grace before 
This brings favor with God. So I asked you the question, what is the group address? It's slaves. Why is it difficult to submit? Because there are masters and rulers that are unkind, unjust, and cruel. And the next thing I asked you was, who is receiving the grace in verses 19 and 20? And we already addressed one group. Slaves receive grace. They receive the grace of submission and suffering. Who's the other person that receives grace? I put different translations so that you could read them. But look at the New American translation. Verse 20. But if you are patient when you suffer for doing what is good, this is a grace before God. Raise your hand if you've received God's grace. Okay. I'm going to ask you all again. You all are asleep. Raise your hand if you have received God's grace. All right. So it's nearly everybody. So, Scott, I think you're okay. I think we're friends. Uh, how much grace have you received from God? If there was a way that you could give God grace, would you want to do that? I think most of us would feel that way. For all the grace that I've gotten in my life, it would be awesome, it would be awesome to give God some grace back. For all the grace that he's given me. You know what Peter says? You learn how to submit to cruel and unjust people. That is a gracious thing before God. You give God grace. Questions or comments? Glenchy. John, what do you think? <laughs> uh, so I, I, that's a great question. Uh, does submission uh, mean obedience? When you ask just that question, I would say yes. Submission does mean obedience. You voluntarily give your will to someone else. But the follow-up portion, uh, I think, is really challenging. Um, if your Submission requires you to just do that something, do something that is unlawful or evil or malicious. Do I still have to do that? And in that question, I would say no. God has given us the provisions that we ultimately are submitting to Him. And I think sometimes we maybe want to fool ourselves into thinking, well, like, I can't do that because that's evil and malicious, um, when really it just doesn't align with our views or our ideologies, and it's not really a sin, we just don't like it. And so we're going to say, well, like, uh, I can't do that, and we'll turn around and do, do something similar. Um, so that's a, a it's a wonderful discussion, um, but in short, I would say, no, God does not require us to practice evil to show submission. Uh, God does not require us to practice sin to show that his grace is abounding. Um, is he a, a hand up there, Catherine? Did you? You addressed it. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. And then one other quick thing. You mentioned, and this has been a soapbox that I've stood on forever, there are a lot of people that are in agreement with the gospel, but there are far fewer who are in submission. Mm, mm. That's why when a wife is in submission until her husband makes a decision and she doesn't like and then she shows out, or somebody has a stand on marriage and divorce, which is scriptural, until somebody in their family divorces and then they're no longer in agreement, it's not a moral compass, it's a way of life. Man, that, was, that was well said. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not ever linked those two together, uh, but I'll, if I mess this up, just correct me. I like that, that concept that many of us are in agreement with the gospel, 
but we are not in submission to the gospel. That's really well said, brother. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, it is, it is really easy to, uh, to come down hard on things when it's not about me uh, and I'm not involved. It doesn't affect someone that I care about. Uh, it becomes a lot more challenging when it starts hitting closer to home. And, and that's why I think understanding God's truth and not suppressing God's truth, going back to, to Romans chapter 1, uh, is so important that, that we have a stance for God's truth and that we can hold one another accountable uh, for what truth is. That it's not just truth to me, but it is just God's truth. Uh, other questions or comments? I know we went through a lot there, um, and I appreciate you guys letting me finish some of the thoughts that I had. Other questions or comments that you guys have? On uh, submitting to government or submitting to unjust masters or rulers or giving God grace? Yeah, Mike? I think the obvious example of what you're talking about is David. David? Okay. Okay. Submitting, to, yeah, to Saul, because he's God's anointed. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Like conviction? Yeah. No, not Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great example. So Saul was the king. He was anointed by God. David was also anointed by God. And David could have easily been like, hey, I'm also king. But he submitted himself uh, to someone uh, who was persecuting him, who was trying to kill him, who ripped his wife away from him, who ripped his best friend away from him, who ran him out of his house and, and, uh, and city. And yet he is willing to submit so much so that his conscience is bothered when he cuts a portion of Saul's robe um, just to show that he had the opportunity to kill him and he didn't. Uh, it's a great example. And, and yet we find it difficult to submit um, to, to parties that, that are not physically oppressing us. Um, it's a good statement. Uh, other questions or comments? There is something else I want to point out here. If you look back with me uh, in First Peter chapter, um, this is a point I like to make when I study verse 17 with people. Honor all people. Pretty exclusive, right? No, it's inclusive of everybody. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. He means most of the brotherhood, right? Like, Jacob is kind of hard to love, you know. So he just means love most of them. Fear God. I can't argue with that. Honor the king. And we're going to look, and I say we're, y'all and Luke, uh, who's going to take over for me while I'm gone for these next couple weeks. Uh, y'all are going to look at what it means to honor people, uh, that it's not just with lip service, because the example that we're about to get to is in chapter 3, verse 1, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands. See, here's the thing, though. You don't understand. My husband physically abuses me. You don't understand. My husband mentally abuses me. You don't understand the emotional turmoil that I'm in. First of all, I want to tell y'all, I understand physical abuse. If you need someone to talk to, talk to me. I understand that. Very well. But secondly, these things are challenging. And we don't need to shy away from these conversations. And unfortunately, I can't uh, get into my thoughts on these things uh, at the end of this class. And I know Luke will do a tremendous job in, in opening up those discussions. But these things are hard. And when you study with people, and I hope you are studying with people, don't shy away from hard conversations. Because if you tell that woman, hey, put your hope in your husband no longer abusing you, and that doesn't happen, you will shatter her hope. And she will walk out that door and never come back. You tell her, put your hope in God and in the grace that is to be revealed, 
doesn't matter what her husband's doing to her. It doesn't matter if it ever stops. Her hope is rightly fixed where it should be. Uh, that's the class that we have for this morning. A um, couple uh, more verses for your consideration. Um, we've got to make sure that we are professing these things. Uh, again, uh, talking about things like evangelism, I think it's important that we as people show lives of submission, that we show lives of good behavior, not just lip service, that we confess that Jesus is the Lord of our life, and then we live lives that, that are according to that, that we're not like the rest of the world and we are maligning people that we don't agree with, uh, because people will see that. And in fact, there's a lot of reasons why people aren't Christians, but I think a very major reason is the hypocrisy that we practice, right? Uh, and I don't mean we here at, at university, uh, but the hypocrisy that Christianity practices. People see that. So let's not do those things, um, and Peter's going to talk more about that as we get into uh, his letter. Thank you guys so much for your attention this morning. Y'all are dismissed.